Hour after hour, that man of God sat still. Those who were accustomed to waiting on him would come into the room and they would see him. Time and time again, they saw Luther was a man who was absorbed in his meditation upon a single verse in the Gospels. He sat so still, they almost thought he had died. He neither moved his hand, he neither moved his foot, he, he, he neither ate, he neither drank. He was just consumed in his thoughts about this one verse. He sat in his chair almost like he was in a trance. His eyes were wide open. He's not asleep. He's thinking, his mind is actively engaged as he ponders over and over in his mind the words of Jesus where he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? After many long hours in which he seemed almost lost to everything else that was going on around him, he got up out of his chair. And someone heard him say, God forsaking God. No man can understand that. And he went on his way. Friends, it's to that very same verse that we're coming this morning. And I have little doubt that as we will go on our way today, we too will be, will be struck with the same sense that there's something about the fourth saying of our Lord Jesus from the cross that it really is just beyond, beyond the comprehension of a human mind. You see, if one of the great minds of church history, if he struggled to understand all that Jesus was saying, all that Jesus was meaning in this fourth saying from the cross, then surely we shouldn't be surprised. If we respond in the same way and we say to ourselves, God forsaking God, I, I can't understand it. Well, may God give us light. May God give us some measure of understanding as he speaks to us from his word. This morning we're in Matthew chapter 27 and I want to draw out three lines of thought from our passage this morning. The darkened sky, the forsaken cry and the truths to apply. They're the three things we're going to look at. It's Matthew 27. If you've got it there, look with me as we read the two verses of our concentration. Verse 45 Matthew 27 verse 45 says, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now for three hours earlier in the day, for three hours from nine o'clock to midday, on that Friday morning, there were many things that were happening at Calvary, many things that were happening in and around the cross. Obviously, the soldiers nailed Jesus to the cross. We know that the soldiers were involved in casting lots. They were, they were gambling for Jesus' clothes to see who would get the spoils. We know that there were people walking past the cross. The cross is outside the, the walls of Jerusalem. It's a, there's a, a road to walk by. They're just going past and they're mocking Jesus as they walk past. The religious leaders join in. They scoff. The robbers mocked. In those first three hours from nine o'clock to twelve, Jesus only spoke three brief sentences. The first one was heavenward. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The second one was to the men on either side of him or to one of those criminals more correct, where he says, today you will be with me in paradise. And the third one, which would be a fitting text for a Mother's Day, Jesus addresses his mother. He speaks to Mary. He speaks to John. Behold, woman, your son. And behold, your mother. But then something at that point, something after those three hours and those three sentences, something incredible unfolded at Calvary. 
We might simply put it this way. The lights went out. The lights went out. Which brings us to our first thing this morning, the darkened sky. That's mentioned for us in verse 45. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. We shouldn't get tripped up here. This is not speaking about a clock time that we're used to in our Western culture and in the 21st century. In terms of the way that we talk about time carved up throughout a day, this is actually uh, uh, speaking about midday to 3 p.m. Now those morning hours, which I just made reference to to remind you, those three hours in the morning were horrific. For Jesus. The physical agony, the emotional trauma, all that was coming together in those three horrific hours for Jesus. But then something unfolds that was not done by man. All that other stuff was done by man. What unfolds here is a direct act of God. Because it says there was darkness over all the land. Three hours. When? From the sixth hour, that is midday in our terms, until the ninth hour, that is 3 p.m. And so here it is at midday. A strange phenomenon falls over the entire land, it says. It's, it's midday, but it's like it's midnight. Midnight with no moon shining. Pitch black. The three hours between noon and three, nothing is told to us of what happened. Except this, that it was dark. There's this strange, eerie silence that's cast over this three-hour period. Nothing at all in the Bible is told us except there's this intense blackness. You see, as horrific as those first three hours were from nine o'clock to twelve o'clock, the next three hours were far, far worse. Well, how do we explain, like how do our human minds try and understand, how do we explain the darkness at a time of day when the sun should be shining the brightest? Like, what, what would turn the switch off? In Luke's account of this occasion, he says the sun was obscured. The sun was darkened or obscured. It was as if God himself did flick the switch and the lights just went out. Now, of course, some have quick, quickly, well, I know what it is. It was just a human phenomenon. It was just the normal thing that happens, just, a, the, you know, the solar so cycle. And, and, and all it really was was a solar eclipse. That, that's what happened. It, no, no big deal. Nothing to get excited about. This is just what normally happens. It could not have been a solar eclipse, eclipse. And we know that because this happened at the time of Passover. And the Passover always falls. That's how you know when Passover falls. It falls when there is a full moon. How long did this darkness last? This darkness lasts three hours. The longest eclipse goes for seven and a half minutes. This is a special act of God. The darkened sky. God was saying something through the darkness. There was a message in the darkness itself. Think about all the people that lived in Palestine. In another town away who didn't even know about what's going on outside Jerusalem. They were affected by this. Everyone in Palestine, the darkness was over all the land. You see, that's not exactly something you could just ignore, just fob off. This, this eerie darkness covers the entire land from midday to three. Well, what was God saying when he enveloped the land in darkness? And really, what's he saying to us through this? Well... When we dig around in our Bibles, we find that the concept of darkness uh, is often presented to us as a symbol of God's judgment. Listen to the Apostle Amos. In Amos chapter 8, he says, And it will come to pass that I will make the sun go down at noon. 
and I will darken the earth in broad daylight, he says. I will turn your feasts into mourning, that's weeping, and all your songs into lamentations. I will make it like mourning for an only son, and its end will be like a bitter day. Now in that culture, if you had an only son, and he died... That was horrific for that family. That's sort of like the end of the family line. What's going to happen to the inheritance? That was a major, major, major thing. It brought about great mourning. And he's saying this is what it's like, what he's describing. When the lights go out in the middle of the day, it's a time of great woe. It's a time of great bitterness. We look again into our Bibles and we see how The last day, the day of judgment, is actually described in Revelation chapter 6. It's called the day of God's wrath and no one can stand. It says, as a day that the sun becomes black as sackcloth. The day of judgment described as a day of darkness. Of course, most of us are well aware of the fact that one of the ways that Jesus describes hell is it, it is a place of outer darkness. Hell's a place of God's wrath. It's a place of His judgment. Now, God is not absent from hell. That's what sometimes people think. No, God is present in hell in all of His holy fury, in all of His holy justice. Outer darkness, therefore, speaks of God's active judgment. And so you've got the idea, this concept of darkness in the Bible is often presented as a symbol of God's judgment. But that's not the only way darkness is presented, because sometimes darkness is associated with sin. Is it not? You think about that, those of you who know your Bibles. The the people of God are described as people of light, whilst those outside of Christ are called people of darkness. And so Paul says, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Light is often associated with holiness. And darkness is associated with ungodliness or with sin. And that's why Jesus says men love darkness because their deeds are evil. They don't want to come to the light lest their deeds be exposed. And again, Paul says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You got the point? For three hours there is darkness as Jesus hangs on the cross. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. The sinless, spotless Lamb of God, He who was undefiled, He who was separate from sinners, is the bearer of sin. Is it any wonder? The lights went out. If you come back to the passage, you'll see verse 46 goes on when it says, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. About the ninth hour, we've established the fact that that's 3 p.m. in our thinking. Now, why 3 p.m.? Is that just, well, just stab in the dark? Like, why 3 p.m.? Is there anything significant there with it being 3 p.m.? Well, you betcha there is. You think about the scriptures, you think about the Jewish way, the third The third hour in the afternoon, 3 p.m. as we call it, that was the time of the Jewish evening sacrifice. And here is Jesus doing his wonderful work of atonement. 3 p.m. Three hours of thick curtain has been drawn across the heavens. The great high priest has gone behind the thick curtain. He's gone into the most holy place. He's out of sight from the rest. And he stands at the altar of the Lord and he's making intercession for his people as a great high priest does. He's performing his sacrificial function. No human can see what he does. He's behind this curtain, as it were. But he is acting as his people's mediator. This is what he came to do. And this is what he's doing in those three hours. He's bearing sin. He's dealing with sin. He's working on our behalf. But this priest isn't carrying a sacrifice, is he? Because he is the sacrifice. 
Remember, this is Passover time, this, when this whole thing is happening. And you see, the darkness actually does point us back to the first Passover too, doesn't it? Where darkness covered the entire land. Before the Passover, there was that supernatural darkness. But then the Passover lamb's blood was shed in order that the blood would provide a covering. And so here is Jesus' blood being shed. Jesus, our Passover, his blood providing a once for all covering for sinners. As Jesus is bearing our sin, he is thrown, we might say, into the consuming sacrificial fire of God's wrath because of sin. And it all comes it all comes as it were. It comes as a crescendo. At the end of those three grueling hours of silent darkness, Jesus then expresses his fourth saying from the cross. And so we've seen the darkened sky. Now quickly, let's move and consider secondly, the forsaken cry. I want you to think of this. For three hours has not just been dark. For three hours there has been silence. I mean, just try and imagine the eerie silence that would have settled over a bustling city with all the visitors who had come to town because of Passover. And the lights go out, there's thick blackness, there's silence for three hours. No mention anywhere in the scriptures or the gospel accounts of a word spoken by anyone. But then at 3 p.m. it all changes. Despite all the horrible treatment that Jesus had received previously at the hands of men, remember what he was like in terms of his response when men did do stuff to him. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. But he opened not his mouth. Remember what men were doing in those first three hours, of the, on those morning hours. Man was swinging the hammer to drive the nails through his flesh. Man was ridiculing, man was gambling, man was taunting, man was thrusting his spear, man was doing all this, and Jesus, completely silent. No retaliation. He opened not his mouth. But when God comes, when God deals with his son in those silent hours of darkness, it was then that he cries out. It says in verse 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Did you notice how Matthew describes the voice of Jesus? He even gives us something of a description of the volume. He didn't just cry out with his voice, he says with a loud voice. And think, he's on the cross. That, that physical act of speaking out with a loud voice because of what he was going through physically was, was not easy. He's slumping down, he's, he's struggling to breathe because of the very posture in which he is, he is in there. He, he, he's, he's trying to rally, you see, his dying strength just to push himself up on the cross to fill his lungs with enough air that he might be able to speak, that he might be able to loudly have a voice that is heard. The word that Matthew uses is the word from which we get our English word mega. You know what it's like when something's a mega truck, that's a big truck. We used to have megaphones. The older ones will know about megaphones. The younger ones won't. You know what a megaphone is? That's, that's the, so that your voice could be heard. Phone. So your voice could be heard further away. So a mega voice is like mine. It's a loud voice. That's what Jesus had. Jesus wants all to hear. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. What does he want them to hear? We go to the English translation and bypass the Aramaic or the Hebrew. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, now our attention is no longer focused on what man is doing to Jesus. This cry, it breaks the three hours of silence. 
and it takes us into something that's like we might call the unseen world behind these events, the unseen world to the human eye between the Son and the Father. Because he says, my God, that unseen world of spiritual reality, just because you can't see it does not mean it's not real. The unseen world of spiritual reality begins to thunder in the ears of those who could hear Jesus' voice. Something is going on in heaven's court. All oh, those physical struggles must have been immensely difficult for Jesus. And often that's just the focus when people think about the cross. But what was going on between the Father and the Son was so far far worse. Under his physical sufferings, Jesus held his tongue. But under these soul sufferings, he cried out loudly. You see, in this cry from the cross, Jesus is not coming up with his own words. Perhaps you can see this in your Bible. It's a quotation. Jesus is actually quoting directly from Psalm 22. That's a great psalm in itself for us to study as a description, a prophecy of these things. But in Psalm 22, he goes on to say, Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, he says, or that could be in English, roaring. Because the Hebrew word for groan comes from the same root word which means to howl. Or it has the idea to roar like a lion. You see the affliction was on the sinless sensitive soul of Jesus and it was so sharp or we might say it was so heavy that it caused him to break the silence of a lamb going to the slaughter and he begins to roar like a lion. And that fits because he's the Lion of Judah. You see, his shout, we might call, his loud cry breaks the three hours of dark silence with what are the words that punctuate it? My God. My God. And though it was that the Father had turned away from his Son, Still, Jesus the Son had faith in his God and Father because he doesn't say God, God. He says, my God, my God. You see, all the other supports or, or props we might say, all those things that are visible, all those things are, that we might call sensible comfort, they've all shrunk away. All the followers are basically gone. There's a few women around, but all the other hopes are gone. And what's he doing? He's clinging. To his God. Psalm 22 again goes on to say, But you, O Lord, be not far from me. O strength, hasten to help me. You see, at the crucial hour of his conscious abandonment, still our Lord Jesus has faith in his God. And he holds on. Holds on. This is a wonderful example of what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. Because everything he could see was against him. We go through that, don't we, as Christians? Nothing like this experience, but in terms of a, just a quick passing application, you hold on to God and what he says and who he is. Notice the question that he gets into. Why? Why, God? Ever asked that question? Ever asked that question of God? Why, Lord? You know, when we ask that why God question, most often, it's, it's, it's a question of objection. Or, or it can be even worse than that. It can be a question of rebellion. But Jesus is not asking in rebellion. Jesus is not asking in objection. Jesus has already displayed nothing but sweet submission. Why have you forsaken me? Literally the question is, why did you forsake me? 
As though around three o'clock our Lord was conscious that the forsakenness was past or it was passing and he's reflecting on the experience over which otherwise God has cast total silence for us. His question is, why did you? My Father, my God, why did you forsake me? This is the same Father who has previously said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But now why? Why did you forsake me? You see, what this is doing, this question is doing, it's helping us to get a little bit of an insight into the silent darkness of what was going on behind the curtain. It reveals to us that there has been a period where the relationship to, between the Son and the Father has somehow been affected. Think of what that relationship has been previously for eternity past. The joy of Christ has been to look upon His Father's countenance. That's what He's always done. The Father's presence has been His home. The Father's, we might say, the Father's bosom has been His dwelling place. The Father's glory He had shared in, even before the world was, forever backward, He'd shared in the glory of the Father. And of course, for 30 years, during that whole 30 years on the planet, the Son had enjoyed unbroken fellowship with the Father. Not one thought in His mind was out of harmony with His Father. Not a single decision did Jesus make on this earth that had not originated in the Father's will. Never a moment outside the conscious presence of God. Not one millisecond. But now He asks, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, what a question this is, and we're with Luther right now. Why? So you say, I'm sure, what's the answer to the why? Why was Jesus forsaken as he expresses that word? Well, I believe the safest thing for me to do at this point is to turn you to Scripture and let the Bible answer the Bible's question. Isaiah 53 answers the question to some degree for our human mind when it says he was smitten by God, he was afflicted, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The Lord laid on him, on Christ, what? A crown? Well, yeah, eventually. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah says toward the end of that chapter, he bore the sin of many. Again, let me quote to you from the book of Habakkuk. Because Habakkuk describes God in this way where he says, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and you cannot look on wickedness. Oh, we have plummeted just in that text alone into the mysteries of the Godhead. It was because the Saviour was bearing our sins that the Holy God must turn His face away from Him. It pleased the Lord to crush Him, to bruise Him. It was Jehovah's will to crush his only son. Jesus was enduring the fury of God's wrath upon sin. Not his sin, but the sin that was laid upon him. Our filthy sin. Someone had to bear sin. If a people would be forgiven and saved, this is what mediators do. Someone had to be forsaken so that those that he represents can be received by God. Someone had to be separated from God's favourable presence as he bore sin so his people could be saved. For three hours there was silence. For three hours there was darkness. But around three o'clock at the end of those three hours, the silence is broken and of course the darkness lives. Because sin had been paid for. 
And he effectively now says, this is what God has done with your sin, Christian. The son was forsaken so that you as a sinner who turns from your sin and places your personal trust in this Jesus so that you will never be forsaken by God. It was God's wrath against sin. It was God's own righteousness, his own justice. That's what Jesus satisfied. And so we've seen the darkened sky, we hear the forsaken cry. Now thirdly and finally, the truths to apply. What, what, what are the lessons that we can learn from this, friends? What are the lessons that God would want us to learn? What are the things that He, by His Spirit, would want to be working today in your mind and in your heart and pressing into our conscience this morning that this is not just a nice trip down memory lane or a nice trip into history to see what happened once, but that this has a direct relevance for us today. Let me suggest three things. Firstly, friends, see the seriousness of sin. The seriousness of sin. This fourth saying from the cross shows us how God regards sin. This is what God thinks of sin. Sin is so serious that the Father in heaven not only sent His only Son to earth, but then He forsakes His sin, His Son, the Son that He dearly loves, because sin is laid upon Him. This is how God regards sin. Now let me ask you, how do you regard sin? Not someone else's sin. We're all pretty quick at knowing what that is. What's your attitude about your own sin? Are you indifferent to your own sin? It's easy for us to get cranky at other people's sin when they're people near us and they upset us. And be very indifferent to our own sin. Do you try and cover it over? Excuse it? Blame someone else? Focus on anything and everything but your own sin. Maybe you try the old distraction tactic because you are trying the best you can to avoid thinking of your own sin. But you know, you know, you know how it works. We, we, we all, we all, we're all here in this situation. We can laugh it off. We can fob it off. We can think it's nothing really that big and the whole time we're running away from spiritual reality. My friend, I want to ask you, how can any of us regard sin lightly when we see how God deals with it? When we see how much sin costs Jesus, when we see here in this passage what sin did to Jesus and to His Father... If you are not right with God today, stop, my friend. Please stop and see what God does with sin. That's what we're seeing. What God does with sin. And think of what He will do with your sin. That there is no avoiding the seriousness of sin when we will stand before God. We can try and avoid it now, but there's a day coming when we will not be able to avoid it. And so I want to say to you in love, yield your heart to Him. See the Savior bearing your sin, suffering for you, so that you would be saved. I think one of our problems is we live in a permissive society that has, in a way, really just had a dulling effect upon our sensitivity to sin. You know how it goes. Everyone's doing it. Isn't that so often the attitude? Well, she's doing it, says the child to the parent. So why can't I do it? Everyone's doing it. And after a while, we seem to be less offended by it, less troubled by it, less sensitive to what sin actually is and what it did to our Lord. You see, this is why we must regularly come back to the cross. How can you love that which 
pierce not just his body, but how can you love that which pierced the heart of the eternal, majestic Son of God? We hear such stuff and we just push it away. And we don't realise how shocking it is. What would you think if my son, Tom, who I love dearly, what would you think if he was murdered by being stabbed? That's that's horrific, yes, but that's not my point. What would you think about me? If I would go and find the blood-stained knife that was used as the implement to kill it, that I kill him, that I would pick up that knife and I would begin to cuddle it. That I would love that knife like a close friend. What would you think of me? You say, you're crazy. I mean, that's disgusting. That's the instrument that took his life. How can you love it? Sin was the knife that killed Jesus. How can we be a friend of sin? How can we cuddle up to it? How can we think it doesn't really matter? Friends, see what sin did to Jesus. See the seriousness of sin. The second thing that surely comes to us from this passage is the fearfulness of judgment. The fearfulness of judgment, the the forsaken cry of Jesus, it actually is like a prophecy. It foretells the final condition of every lost soul. Forsaken of God's goodness forever. Not forsaken of his presence, as I said before, always in his presence of holy wrath but forsaken of his love, forsaken of his grace, forsaken of his mercy, forsaken of his aspects of goodness. That the God who is holy and just, he must judge sin wherever it is found. For him not to do so would for him not to be just. If the Father did not spare his own Son when sin was found on him, what hope is there for you if you are outside of Christ when you stand before God as your judge? What hope have you got? If he would not spare his Son whom he had dearly loved from eternity, what hope do you think you have because you've been to church and you've done some good? Jesus went to church. Jesus did lots of good. Jesus was God. You see, here's the point. Unless you have gone to Jesus Christ and been cleansed of your sin, and not only that, but the glorious part covered with his righteousness, unless you turn to him and seek him for salvation, you're going to experience outer darkness. And that's not just for three hours. That's going to be no hour could be counted. It's forever. This saying of Jesus from the cross calls every person to come to Jesus Christ for salvation. It says to every person, stop blaming someone else for your sin. Stop trying to deflect it. Stop trying to ignore it. Look to Jesus for the righteousness that you do not have, but the righteousness that he offers you by grace through faith. He endured those three hours of being forsaken. So that someone undeserving like you and like me could be received by him. The seriousness of sin, the fearfulness of judgment, and now quickly and lastly, the magnificence, friends, of love. And this is the right order, I believe. You don't understand love unless you understand the aspect of the judgment of God. It makes no sense. It's just slop. We see here the magnificence of love. I address you who are Christians. If you're saved today, 
You're one of them. Ultimately, it's not because the Romans beat Jesus. It's not ultimately because the Romans nailed Jesus to the cross. You are saved because Jesus bore your sin on the cross and the Father's wrath crushed his only Son on your behalf. He experienced hell for you, Christian. He endured the darkness and the silence of divine wrath for you. Why would he do that? Because he loves you. How do we explain that? We can't. We're with Luther. Paul says in Galatians, the Son of God loved me. How's that proven, Paul? Well, the Son of God loved me and he gave himself for me. For me. The God so loved the world that he gave himself. His only Son. Such love that He is willing to abandon His Son for otherwise hell-deserving, undeserving sinners. The cry from the cross, this fourth saying of our Lord, shows us surely something it helps us somehow to begin to have some sort of measurement of the width and the length and the height and the breadth of the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Oh, friends, for all that we don't understand about this scene, understand this. Here is love. The magnificence of God's love. It's infinite. It's eternal. It's perfect. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Well, may God bless these words, not only to our minds to understand them more, but to our souls. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we stagger to think of the truth that you would even have any thought to be bothered with such rebellious, careless, thoughtless, self-centered creatures like us. We are grateful that you are not like us. We are grateful that your love has no limits. We are grateful that your grace has no limits, that there is no sin that's too hard for your grace to conquer. We thank you for this scene that you have let us see again this morning and for the words that we've heard, the words of Jesus. And now, Lord, we pray as we come to your table, that we might come with hearts of reverence, hearts inflamed with a fresh measure of devotion for our precious Saviour, our Lord Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.